But I thought for our founders and for people who want to learn about yeah. this, who would, you know, would dream about creating something like you created, we go back to the start and talk about those early days and some of those experiences to help sure. um, others. And so if we can kind of go back, when did you start Morningstar and, and where did the original idea come from? So uh, I grew up here in the Midwest. I'm from Indiana. I went to school at the University of Chicago. And uh, I went to both undergrad and to business school at uh, Chicago. And I went to business school with the idea of becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I'd done a few side little ventures growing up, whether it's selling soda for my college dorm room, running a lot, selling Christmas trees. So as a liberal arts undergrad, I thought hey, maybe I, you know, starting a business could be a, a, a great career, very creative, and uh, I seemed to enjoy the, the business aspect of these little ventures. So I went to business school with that in mind. Uh, while at Chicago, I studied investing and learned all about efficient markets. And uh, the message I learned uh, was that markets are efficient. You can't beat the market. Fire your stock analyst. So it didn't really get me excited about investing. I understood it. I learned it. Oh, what year is, is this? So this, uh, uh, 78 to 80, I went to business to school. Uh, but then I also came across Warren Buffett at the time, who was a pretty obscure figure back then. Uh, today, everybody knows who he is. Just to give you some idea, when I first looked at Berkshire Hathaway stock in the late 70s, it was trading for about $300 a share. Today, it's over $200,000 a share. Wow. So that's how small and out of the way Warren Buffett was. But anyway, his philosophy got me very excited about investing. And so I went after I finished school and pursued a career as a stock analyst. Uh, and you know, one of the things I did uh, to teach myself about stock analysis was to write away to smart money managers who I admired to see what they were buying for their portfolio. So I'd write away to John Templeton, get his reports. Why is he buying HSBC? I'd go study that stock. What's he selling? So I did this as a way to teach myself about stock anal, uh, analysis to study the great investors. But as I had all of these mutual fund reports on my table, it got me to look at the fund industry. And I thought, it'd be great if somebody compiled all of this great information into a compendium. And it got me very excited about the concept of a fund. Uh, and I thought these made a lot of sense for the average person to invest in, that for pennies on the dollar, you could hire the very best money manager. Previously, you'd have to be a Rockefeller, uh, Vanderbilt to hire really great money managers, but so fund to, democratized that. So to talk, talk about that for a minute, because it's a big vision, and now with the benefit of retrospect and being in late 2016, um, it's one people are familiar with. But in 1980, what was the, what did, first of all, what did the mutual fund industry look like in scale and size and, and uh, when you had that vision? And, and also, what did the, um, how much of the interest that people had was investing in mutual funds versus a lot of publicity about the 10 stocks you should own or yep. investing for yourself? Yeah, mutual funds, it was a very different time and era where mutual funds were a very niche industry. It was not a hot industry by any means. Just to give you some idea, when I started, the whole industry was 300 billion in assets. Today it's 16 trillion. So it's gone up over 50x. Household penetration of funds back then was probably 12, 13% of households invested in funds. Today, it's in the mid 40s. So funds have really gone from a niche industry to something very mainstream, powered by things like 401k plans, which got in people invested for the first time. So talk a little bit about that because, you know, I think everybody feels like I could have seen that any trend with the benefit of hindsight, because of course it's always obvious when the, it's all played out. What, what, what said to you that what, allowed, what do you think gave you that, um, the signals that that would be the case here um, that that wasn't the conventional wisdom at the time? I think it was a belief in the concept of a mutual fund, that this was a great way to provide investment market exposure to broad masses of people. It made sense to me, again, to hire the very best money managers. You weren't basing a business on uh, something that could go away. Uh, I remember in the late 70s, real estate partnerships were very popular. But you know, a stroke of Congress made a lot of these obsolete. <coughs> but funds, I thought, had a really good future. I, saw, I thought they should be used by more people. But moreover, I could see they were growing, but they were being misused. The people were buying funds for the wrong reasons. So back then, if you could find any data on a mutual fund, it was total return data. And that was it. But I knew enough about investing to know that you could have two funds that each return 10% per year over a decade, 
but one gets there going like this, and one gets there very steady in a lower risk manner. Two different funds for two different kinds of investors. So what I wanted to do was to bring the same kind of rigorous fundamental analysis that I enjoyed as a stock analyst, which is what I did before I started Morningstar, to bring that to fund investors to help them make smarter decisions. So I really wanted to tell the story, what was driving those returns? Look at the portfolio, see what's the characteristics of the underlying companies, look at the uh, fees, expenses, look at the manager, what's their philosophy, really put together that complete mosaic so people could make more informed decisions about what funds to buy. Talk a little bit about that choice, if you would, because you graduated from USC and you went to work for Harris Associates, a terrific firm, yep. before starting Morningstar. What made you decide to do that, and, and, and yep. what, what, how, how did that add or take away from your... So I had this idea for Morningstar probably when I was 25, 24, 25. But, you know, I was pretty young, and like a lot of good ideas people have, uh, I wasn't absolutely convinced. I, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I thought I should kind of let this idea percolate <laughs> and see if it remains a good idea in six months, a year, two years, continue to research the area. Moreover, I was interested in investing, and I thought I should go get some real-world experience at an investment firm and actually work at a mutual fund organization to see what was available to, say, to institutional investors. And so I went to work, as you mentioned, at Harris Associates, a, a firm here in town, which practiced a Warren Buffett style of investing. And it was really great. I worked with some terrific people who are still friends of mine today. But as I say, they practiced this Warren Buffett style of investing. In fact, we were the largest institutional owner of Berkshire Hathaway stock at the time. Wow. And I was the analyst who got to cover Berkshire Hathaway. So it was, it was an awesome job. Uh, but at the same time, I had this entrepreneurial idea, this interest. And I could see funds continue to grow, and this idea kind of passed the test of time. So after a couple of years, I was more convinced than ever that this was a good idea and it had the characteristics that somebody without a lot of capital could get started in pursuing it. So you have the benefit of hindsight now. Obviously, you can't replay and only get to live one life, but there's a um, school of thought in the entrepreneurial world today, <coughs> excuse me, where people say, just get in the game. Some people even say, drop out of college and just get in the game. Um, you. Uh, after U of C went to work for Harris for a couple of years, you learned something there. Obviously, what, I, I, the benefit of hindsight, do you think, uh, which path do you think uh, allowed you to go further? Did the, there's there an impact, or would it have been six, one, half dozen, the other? Are there learnings you got out of being in the industry that you think helped you navigate the, the, the maze, so to speak, to build Morningstar? How do you see that with the benefit of hindsight? Yeah, I think it was valuable to work a couple years for somebody else, to see how an investment firm is run, uh, to see how somebody else runs a business, rather than just jumping headlong into it. Uh, and so I would advise anybody, if you're looking to start a business, if you're young, go work for somebody uh, for a few years, learn on somebody else's dime. <laughs> You'll learn a lot at any organization of things you want to do more of, things you want to do less of. And uh, it certainly helped me. Uh, I'm not sure it was absolutely essential, but it gave me more confidence in my idea. It let me fine tune the idea. And so I would certainly do that again. I guess what I wouldn't do is spend too long there. You know, I spent a few years there, you know, to spend a decade there, 15 years, you know, I think you're, you'd go down on the learning curve. So it's good to spend a, a bit of time <coughs> somewhere else, but maybe not too much time. Right, okay, good. Uh, you talked about the unmet need and how you as a stock analyst had all this data and mutual fund analysts, or mutual fund Buyers didn't have that same, and you wanted to create Morningstar, I think, to create that yep. same capability for them. You also talked about seeing an emerging trend. Mutual funds were a very small part of the investment pool for individuals. You thought it'd be a big pool, and um, it seems like that got, well, not only were you right about that, but the 401k emergence and the internet sort of accelerated that. Yeah. Um, talk about, as an entrepreneur and someone who um, mentors entrepreneurs, someone who owns publications that are in some ways the Bibles of the entrepreneurial movement with Inc. and uh, Fast Company. Um, talk a little bit about your thoughts on the benefit of just seeing an unmet market need or the, you know, what that does for an entrepreneurial thing versus seeing an unmet market need and identifying something for which there's the tailwind of an emerging trend. How important is that to building a big business, do you think, having both versus just finding an unmet need? 
Yeah, certainly, uh, I think, highly desirable to have uh, an industry that's growing. Uh, you know, if it's not growing, if it's not an emerging trend, if it's not, if you don't see some growth, you've got to take away share from somebody else. So even though you're finding a need, uh, I'd rather go into kind of virgin territory where there's either no competition or a lack of competition. Uh, I always thought in running a business, uh, especially without a lot of capital in the early years, I really want to avoid competition. I don't want to avoid the big guys. I want to go where there's a need, it's growing, but I don't see a lot of competition. Uh, and so I think it's finding that need, but also having the wind at your back with some growth is certainly helpful than right, trying to fight competitors and mm -hmm. steal share, getting people to move over to a solution. It's got to be you know, many X better <laughs> to get somebody to move. If it's an emerging trend, it's a newer area, I think your clients will will forgive you for not having the perfect solution because you're early, they understand, as long as you're getting better and you can iterate. Uh, but to kind of get out early, I think is an advantage an entrepreneur should kind of seize if they can. Uh, that's really helpful advice, I think, because it's easy to fall in love with an idea um, or a trend and look at that intersection, it's interesting. You, you talked about getting out there with those early customers, being a little more forgiving. For you, who were those early customers? Who were those initial customers, and how did you find them the first year or two? So what I was thinking when I started Morningstar was, um, as I mentioned, to help investors make smarter decisions. And the people I was thinking of as our target audience were individual investors. These were the people buying funds. It seemed like the logical audience. And so I reached them through mass marketing techniques. So I took out a full-page ad in Barron's, announcing a new tool for the smart investor, 800 number, coupon, uh, direct mail. But what we found pretty early on was that yes, individuals wanted to receive our data, but also financial advisors were emerging as a category, as a key mm -hmm. audience. And they needed our data to help uh, manage their client portfolios. Uh, there was a phenomena called the breakaway broker where people, advisors were leaving the big wirehouses, the Merrill Lynch's, the Smith Barney's of the world setting up shop on their own, but then they didn't have any research. So we became their de facto research department. And that became a big audience for us over time. So we started with individuals, pretty soon advisors found us, they became a big audience. They loved us, not only were we helpful in uh, managing their, helping them manage their client assets, but also their end clients knew us. Hmm. They knew Morningstar, so it made it more valuable for advisors to work with us. And then once we had a big audience of individuals and advisors, then institutions wanted to work with us. Why? Because their end clients used our metrics to make their investment decisions. Hmm. So they became a big audience for us. And then we created this virtuous circle that we, you know, with institutions as large clients, we could invest more in improving the data content, expanding all of that, which attracted more individuals, which attracted more advisors, more institutions and it had this nice network effect that was pretty powerful. Interesting, interesting. Talk a little bit about the very first product. The, what was the initial, the, yeah. the very first product? So when I started, I was thinking of uh, electronic publishing. So I databased everything from the beginning. The first thing I did was create a big database. But people didn't really consume individuals' um, data in software form in the early 80s. You can remember the IBM PC was introduced in 81. PCs were a hobbyist tool back in the early 80s. It's kind of hard to remember that. So what people still consumed were print publications. So I took all the data, I output it from database into these big you know, computer sheets, this big, and then I would have the printer shoot it down to eight and a half by 11 because it was all output on a dot matrix printer, if you remember those things. <laughs> and it made the dots kind of go away if you printed it out big and you shrunk it down. But I printed a 400 page book. Wow. So I started in April of 84. By December of 84, I had a 400 page book, a mutual fund source book uh, that was output from that database. But it was all, and, I, and then I sold a, a subscription to this book. It came out every three months. You could buy a single copy, you could subscribe to a year. And it was important to have a subscription because it created a bit of float, deferred subscription income where people paid us in advance of services to be rendered in the future. And I knew this going in, that it made it possible to get started without a lot of capital because people would pay us in advance. So even before I you know, 
had to pay Barron's for that first ad, before I had to pay the printer for, to pay the, the printing bill, money was coming in. And so this deferred subscription liability today is about $150 million on our balance sheet of money people have paid in advance, or now we allow a bill me option. I didn't in the early days. Uh, but that allowed us to grow Morningstar over the years without raising capital. Our customers essentially funded our growth. So I, th I always advise entrepreneurs to really study that cash flow dynamic. Talk a little bit about that. We, when, our, <clears throat> when we prepared for this on a call, one of the interesting things was, um, as I look at some of the most successful B2B businesses of the last decade or so in Chicago, um, <clears throat> almost all of them uh, raised some seed and angel money, but they didn't raise most of their other capital until later. They had revenue, for, because they had revenue first business models. Um, you built a revenue first business model. You talked a lot about the benefit of what accounts call negative working capital, but essentially being able to generate cash flow internally. Yep. I'm curious, um, your view on the importance of that versus um, what's seen as the more traditional venture model, which is you know fund huge amounts of, of, of uh, equity to um, uh, grow way ahead of your, your revenue and internal cash flow. Um, what do you see as the wisdom of that generally? And um, do you think it's a coincidence that the eight or 10 most successful are that way? Or do you, do you think there might be some correlation? You know, I love, I mean, to use your term, a revenue first business model. I, I love that model. I think it's highly, highly desirable. And if you can find that kind of a model uh, and, you know, have negative working capital, those are the best businesses. Uh, these are the kind of businesses Warren Buffett loves. These kind of capital light businesses. They don't take a lot of capital. Your customers fund them. And I know so many entrepreneurs, not only is Morningstar th that kind of model, but so many people I know have created significant businesses. Uh, you know, I had lunch uh, last week with Michael Polsky. Uh, many of you may know Michael. Uh, successful entrepreneur here in town, but, you know, he got his start building power plants. And, uh, you know, he got... GE, he knew how to build power plants, but he got GE to fund uh, him a, a billion dollars. He bought a billion dollars of turbines uh, from uh, GE, but he lined up the power companies to buy the power. And so without any money, <laughs> you know, without putting up any money, he was able to put this business together because he understood, you know, that I could, you know, borrow it from here, the, the revenue, revenue sources lined up. So if you can find a way to kind of build that kind of a model where, again, negative working capital, uh, I would really look for that because, as you know, the traditional model of most businesses is you will lay out a lot of capital first and then over you know, a lot of inventory, plant, whatever, 60, 90 days you get paid. And so it ties up a lot of working capital. And that's, you know, then you're going to have to raise either debt or equity financing. And certainly many businesses work that way. but. I much prefer the capital light business models. Interesting. Well, I think you know that one of the things, the reason why I think we see it with some of those B two B software service businesses is because being in Chicago in that era, the, there wasn't the same level of venture capital. There might be other places, and so you know they controlled their own destiny and they could grow that way. And ironically, a number of them, when they did raise money, it was secondary money they took to sort of diversify a little bit. Um, but I think it's been a particularly good one here in a place like this where. You know, you can't assume that there's a $20 million check followed by a $50 million check just, you know, con continuing to come. And those owners and those, those entrepreneurs tend to control their businesses. You know, they don't end up as a hired gun with a few points of equity, but they, they've, they've found it and they're, they're the largest if, uh, and often majority shareholder. That's right. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, um, you were an early technology uh, player. You talked about in the early 80s being database first, even when you had to shrink things down into 400-page yeah. books. Um, talk a little bit about that investment. Were there people along the way who said, geez, Joe, why are you making all this investment in technology and, uh, so early? And also, um, you know, to what extent has that paid off for you as the internet and other things came along? Yeah, it's been huge. I don't know if it, we were, uh, there were many skeptics. I think people thought it made sense. Uh, but I think we were always early on with technology. Right. I mean, you were certainly known as somebody who invested heavily uh, at a time when you were still producing a lot of print. Yeah, I mean, even using a PC platform when I started, it wasn't clear a PC could do a business like this because the databases were so large. A big hard drive in the early 80s was five or 10 megabytes. And by the way, it crashed all the time. 
And so, you know, I looked at many computers, time sharing on a mainframe. But if you look at our history, we've had to reinvent Morningstar uh, based on technology changes from, if you remember, MS-DOS mm -hmm. to Windows uh, to the desktop to the internet, and now it's all cloud and mobility. And every, you know, every transition, a lot of competitors <coughs> have fallen off who didn't want to make that investment, and they sold the business or eventually their products were obsolete. But we've always reinvested pretty heavily back into the business. Uh, again, even when maybe it was not uh, apparent that that was a smart thing to do. Um, I'd love to go back to the first product because I think everybody loves the hockey stick. We all focus on the up part of the hockey <laughs> stick. But if you think about the hockey stick, it goes straight for a while or a little up. You, you mentioned to me earlier in your first year you had 100,000 of revenue and then 120, and then you really yeah. started to move up 400 million, 4 million, et cetera, as you go up. Um, and one of the things I think that's interesting and people talk a lot about is there's usually these two-year periods early on in a company's uh, life, the most successful ones, where there's this time of um, figuring things out and you are immersing yourself in a market, you're learning it, you're figuring out the right piece. Um, there was clearly, you know, 20% growth was great, but off 100,000 base was nothing compared <laughs> to going to 400,000, a million, 4 million, 10 million, et cetera. What, what were the insights from that initial product until you started to really hit the inflection point that, um, and, and how, did, how, how did you figure those things out that allowed you to really take off? What, what were those insights? You had the, the every three month product that was great. Yep. Um, you know, what, what did you learn and how did you learn it? Yeah, you know, I really needed those first couple of years to really understand the market, understand our clients and what they wanted. I think if I had had a lot of money on day one to really step on the gas hard, I wouldn't have known how to spend that money wisely. So as you mentioned, the first product, it was a quarterly, every three months, and it was largely data. So one, it was not too timely. Second, it was just data, even though we had some analytics like star ratings that were quantitative. But what I saw in, you know, after a couple years was one, people wanted more timely data, and two, they didn't want only data, but they wanted analysis of that data. And so two years into the business, we launched what was the real growth driver in the 80s, a product called Morningstar Mutual Funds, which had everything on a single page. It came in a binder, uh, and it had qualitative analysis. So we hired a staff of analysts. Don Phillips, head of our research for many years, was the first fund analyst I hired. And his job was to fill up these boxes with qualitative analysis. It came out every two weeks. Uh, but it was through you know, spending a couple years kind of grappling with understanding the needs of our clients and how you know, iterating on this product, what it could do to be better. And I decided ultimately this was not the right horse to bet on. I needed this other product. And that's when we really stepped on the gas and full page ads in Money Magazine, heavy marketing. And that's when the growth really accelerated. It's interesting. I think those nuanced insights are underappreciated. People assume that because anytime you say the insights in hindsight, they're like, well, that makes sense. Of course, everything makes sense in hindsight <laughs> with the benefit of seeing it work. Um, it's a really interesting one. You mentioned the thing about funding and early funding. And um, I'd love to just take a minute before we get to the always fun final questions uh, here, which is take a well, just I want to try a little thought experiment with you because okay. you've built this incredible business. You have um, everyone such admiration and respect for what you've built and what you've done. Um, if early on, not even when that was just starting to take off, someone had um, you had taken ten million dollars of venture capital uh -huh. um, in those early days, um, do you think how would how would if at all would Morningstar be different if you had been capital? intensive instead of capital light. I don't just mean like growth, but I mean like culturally and sort of the way you work, you know, how everybody sees the um, yeah. capital side as the norm and assumes bootstrapping, you know, admires it, but I don't know that people understand um, the sort of things that come out of that experience. How, how would, how, do you think Morningstar would be different if you'd been capital heavy instead of capital Yeah, light? absolutely. Uh, you know, I think we still would have done well, but we would be a different company today. I mean, I think just like uh, a human being where if you're raised in poverty or wa raised in wealth, <laughs> you're probably going to have a different character. And I think kind of growing up in a capital 
uh, restrained manner um, forges your cultural DNA uh, in terms of you learn that money isn't always the solution to problems. Mm -hmm. That there's probably an intellectual solution if you think hard enough, uh, work hard enough, if there's a way to solve something without throwing money at the problem. And I think had we raised a lot of money, I mean, you, you don't know exactly how these things would have played out, but I would be fearful that we would get into the habit of just throwing money. Here's a problem, let's hire somebody. Here's a problem, let's spend more in marketing. And we're using money to solve our problems instead of, hey, maybe there's you know, a technological solution to this. Maybe if we think harder, we can find a way around mm -hmm. this. And believe me, you through whether it's you know elbow grease, staying up, burning the midnight oil, there's usually ways to solve things right. without money. And again, I think that becomes part of the culture, this frugality. You know, we use the term scrappy here a lot at Morningstar. Let's be scrappy and not always, again, throw money at a problem. And I think it's a healthy characteristic for a company. I think, I think it is. I think a lot of people think of, of, of you know, frugality and, and see the obvious sides of it, which are maybe you are smarter about how you spend money and you're not wasteful and do these things. But I think what you hit on is interesting. It's kind of that intellectual adrenaline that comes from constraints. Okay, we can't just hire 10 more people or 20 more people to go solve this. How do we solve this? And it forces people to uh, do the equivalent of the, the, it's the news story you read about the mother whose baby was trapped in a fire and she was superhuman strength to lift the girder yeah, up yeah. to save her. You know, the, the Apollo 13, you know, we've never lost an astronaut in space. We're not going to lose one now. And they solve these incredible problems. That sort of intellectual adrenaline um, is forced on you if you can't just throw money and bodies at a problem and time. And I think, I think that's a really important insight. And most people just see the, well, you're better at budgets, you know. <laughs> and I think that's actually a superpower that you know companies can have to be that kind of creative problem solving. So um, it's interesting to hear you say that. Uh, one of the things I always love to end with, and uh, I know we have only just a couple minutes left here, but we have time for these. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur who's been doing this and been as successful as you've been and had the chance to reflect, and obviously, you know, I've been to your Inc. Uh, 500 conferences. There's so many exciting things you do with the magazines you own. Um, as you think back on your own entrepreneurial past and history and experience, are there things you think, boy, I'd never do that again, and or, boy, I'm, I'm glad I did this, I'd always do that again. What would, what would those things, as you think back in your, your career of, you know, that kind of, wisdom of your experience for yourself? Mm -hmm. I suppose if I look back, uh, you know, get even more focused on kind of the real drivers of what makes us successful. I've always admired companies where they don't have 17 products, they've got one product, and they just focus on organic growth of that one product. Uh, I think entrepreneurs often have a tendency to want to do a lot of things, and things that don't really ultimately drive value and so uh, I would say if I, I look back, uh, you know, again, we've had a few key product drivers and probably doubling down and really focusing on those and doing less of these smaller things, uh, even acquisitions. We've done a number of acquisitions. And, uh, you know, if the acquisition can drive that main product, can help fuel that, it can make a lot of sense. But acquisitions that might be more of a distraction, um, it's hard for people, entrepreneurs often, to sit still <laughs> and focus on that core thing. So in terms of what I do more of, again, I think just focusing on that core and getting real religious about not getting distracted uh, uh, would be one, one, one thing. Um, how many employees do you have today? We have 4,300. 4,300. So you've scaled an incredible business. How many here in Chicago? Uh, 1,200. 1,200. So you've built an incredible business here. Um, all of our companies that we invest in, you know, dream of scaling one day to, we all love to be, you know, be able to have a fraction of the kind of success you've had. Um, you scaled in Chicago at a time where there were only so many companies that scaled. You, it wasn't as though um, everybody you had hired had done this before. Um, in Silicon Valley, they like to talk about the fact that, well, you can just pick people off the shelf. The person who scaled Amazon this or, you know, Google that can go do yours. Um, we don't necessarily have the benefit of that, um, but we have a great human capital pool. Advice that you would share um, with entrepreneurs who are growing, like some of the stories you heard today, about how to develop the team and, and, and an elite team like that um, without necessarily having all people who 
you know, have built a company like yours before, where you develop identifying the right people and developing them. What's what? What do you think's been critical to your success in those years of getting from zero to here? Yeah. Well, first of all, Chicago is an awesome place to locate a business. Um, and you're right. We're not Silicon Valley where we have people who've scaled things, but there's incredible human capital here. A couple, you know, many great universities, uh, people with a good, you know, Midwestern kind of work ethic and focus. Uh, so there's a great pool to, 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 to hire from, uh, but you've got to be patient, you know, and I've always approached business with this built to last mentality. This was not a pump it up and sell it <laughs> kind of a venture. And so, uh, yeah, I wanted to grow as fast as I could, but I always thought if we grew at a nice compound rate of growth, we'll be big soon enough. I mean, you talked about an exponential curve. And again, if you can grow at double digit rates, just be patient, you know. People want the overnight success tomorrow. They want to be the next Facebook, the Google. And some of those tendencies can be unhealthy, mm. where too rapid a growth can be harmful. Mm. And so just go, grow at a good, natural rate of growth, and you'll be big soon enough. I mean, we've been in business 32 years, so it's taken time. As you mentioned, from 100,000 to 800 million. Again, that's 30 years of just staying focused on investors, finding other needs, adjacencies, <coughs> not getting distracted. But there's a great pool, again, to hire from. So I think it's overrated that you have to find somebody who know, who scaled something to bring them in here to scale this. That, you know, bright people, you put them around a table, you'll find solutions, you'll figure it out. Uh, you don't necessarily, necessarily have to have somebody with having done it before somewhere. That's great. It's been incredible. Thank you, Joe. It's been a lot of fun, really Pat. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you.